Hi, thanks for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here and meet all of you. So um, as a scientist, I think it's extremely important to try to get the non-expert, the members of the general public, uh, excited about science. I think it's extremely important to try and find new ways of engaging people with scientific ideas. Not just the latest new stuff, but just the, the, the foundation of science, how it works, old ideas, new ideas. It's extremely important. So I'd like to tell you a couple of things that I do toward that mission uh, today. So first of all, let me tell you why I think that's important. And the bottom line is, is that science is part of this wonderful tapestry of amazing things that we do as human beings that we call the culture. It's part of the culture. And I think it should be accessible to all. And it should be something we all uh, take part in, just like any other aspect of the culture, whether it be art or music or poetry or other things. But right now, our society is set up such that science actually isn't thought of that way. It's thought of, this, it's thought of as this specialized, very difficult thing that's done by very strange people with arcane talents. And it's sort of off in a corner on its own. In fact, the cliche goes that somehow science is somehow antithetical to so many of the other things in the rest of the culture. It's supposed to be the opposite of art and intuition and beauty and all of these things and mystery and wonder, and that's not the case. Somehow, we're supposed to uh, believe that if you understand how a flower works at, the, at, at a deep micro level uh, because of scientific investigation, somehow that undermines the beauty of the flower. And that's, of course, wrong, uh, at least in my opinion. I think that's wrong. I think science, if anything, can enhance our appreciation of the world, uh, the mystery, the beauty, all of those things. And so uh, I think science really should be more firmly part of the culture than it really is, than it, than it currently is regarded. So, so that's what I'm up to with these sorts of things. When I'm not doing my usual professor gig, I'm trying to do things that, that help with that in my own small way. So I'll tell you about two kinds of projects. Um, and one of them is to do with um, science advising and trying to get science into the general media, because it's actually a great way of getting science accessible to everyone. One of the important reasons I should mention that science accessibility should be something we care about is because of democracy. If science gets pushed off into a corner and left to uh, just a, a specialized group of people to, to worry about because it's too difficult or too weird or too nerdy, we're not truly democratic. If you think about the number of important decisions that are mentioned in the news about science right now uh, that at their core have science uh, issues, even if they're not overtly science, you realize that democracy really needs better science education. We have you know, the quality of the water we drink, the air we breathe, uh, medical issues, climate change, of course, where we get our energy from. These are all issues to do with science. And understanding the nuances of what science can and can't do is extremely important for everybody to be uh, um, uh, to have access to. So now I'm going to show you a, post, a set of posters of what you might think of as frivolous things that uh, s somehow I shouldn't, you know, as a scientist, as a professor, uh, be be wasting my time on. But let me remind you that uh, the number of hours people spend on entertainment, just looking at various entertainment sources is huge compared to the amount of time they might spend uh, seeking out some sort of educational thing. So, so yes, you could tell me I should go work in schools and fix the problem there. And I go, yes, and if I really care about this issue, why am I not using the most powerful form of communication of ideas that has ever been invented, which is basically movies and TV? Why am I not using that as well? So, so that's the issue for me. It's trying to find ways of uh, sneaking some science in here and there. Now, this isn't about sneaking some spinach into your milkshake. The way I try and think about it, especially when I talk to storytellers, uh, which is this all about, really. It's just stories. Uh, we love stories. The thing I try and do is say it's not sneaking spinach into a milkshake, it's sort of saying, look, here are all these other flavors of milkshake that you haven't even realized you might like. Let's try them. And it'll actually make those milkshakes better. The point is, is that science and learning about science isn't something that's opposite or, or on a different axis to being entertained. 
the two can go together. In fact, science can help you tell better stories, is what I tell filmmakers, uh, and it's true. It can help you tell better stories. Uh, it can make the stories even more immersive because you're actually really more wedded to what's going on because it's more believable. And of course, it just makes the stories more fun. The problem is, is that the industry who makes all of these sorts of things that you can see, uh, and some of which you may have seen, largely doesn't know what a science advisor is. We're mostly regarded as people who are fact checkers. Um, the typical model of science advising, uh, if there is a model at all, is that a thing gets made, or, uh, uh, sorry, a, a script gets written, and uh, it's about to go into production perhaps, and at some point someone uh, realizes maybe we should talk to a scientist about this. Let's sprinkle in some buzzwords, get them to come in and check a few facts. We don't want people popping out of the story because we said this thing instead of this other fact. And so we come in uh, and, and maybe do that, and then, and then you know, they've done their duty, as it were, with regard to the science. Now, sometimes that does help somewhat. You, know, you can help uh, maybe be a, a science dialect coach, right? The scientist would say it this way, not that way, and stuff like that. So you're sort of decorating a little bit on the, on the, on the overall thing that's made. What's really a very successful model, and that's extremely difficult to get to work because people just don't know that that can really work for them, and there's nothing in the industry set up to do that. Um, what can really work is to get the scientists involved very early on. So, for example, with Agent Carter season two and uh, the National Geographic um, anthology on Einstein's life and work from earlier this year, um, I was there right at the beginning when the writers and the showrunners were in the room, sitting around the table, the classic writer's room, here I am as a science advisor, also at the table, talking to them about what they wanted to achieve. So they're still in control. They're still the storytellers. But they're telling me what they want to achieve, first and foremost. And then I can, if necessary, I can teach them the bits of science that they might be looking to learn more about, or I can actually tell them about some science that they didn't realize could actually help with the story. And then they start building on that foundation when they start writing. So they write the, th the threads maybe they intended to write, but now there are whole new opportunities to make uh, all kinds of connective tissue through the science that really is sort of making the science more integral to the storytelling and making the story better in every case. And so in Agent Carter, for example, I was able to give them all kinds of things. I was actually help them, able to help them create the, uh, the universe, as it were, for uh, uh, the setting of their characters and their stories. They had certain kinds of things from the Marvel comics they wanted to implement. I was able to say, well, here's some science, some real science that you can use to, to help that fictional science uh, have some sort of working model. It's still fiction. It's still crazy stuff happening. There's still people with weird powers flying around and what have you. But the point is, is that you can make a self-consistent setup, uh, a set of rules, if you like, that are scientific. They mimic the rules that I know as someone who studies the real universe. I can make up sort of alternative uh, scenarios for them to use that have a similar logic to our universe, so it makes it more believable. And then they build their stories. And then, of course, then I can also do other things, which are also hugely important, perhaps more important sometimes. For example, helping them get reasonably believable scientist characters. Not everybody is going to be then, uh, you know, the, 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 the crazy old man with the white hair, which is, you know, the standard science image um, that we have. You can have a variety of characters uh, that help people to realize that, yes, I can, I can engage with science too. It's not just a particular kind of person who engages with science. With the Einstein show, I was able to help them come up with all kinds of uh, pieces of the real science that Einstein did. I was help, able to help them understand it, and then I was able to come up with ways of integrating it into the telling of his life because a scientist doesn't keep their life and science separate. These things are mixed up. So to tell the Einstein story properly, they really needed that early on. So I was able to help them sift through that stuff. And then in addition, help them decorate the set, put things on the boards, help them say things, write pieces of dialogue, or suggest pieces of dialogue that could really make it believable. So there's so many things you can do with that mission if we can change the model of what a science advisor is. And it's a difficult task, but I've found ways of doing it by sometimes making a nuisance of myself and helping them realize how useful that can be um, uh, at the end of the day. Let me tell you about something different. 
Um, oh, I should have said, of course, the other thing, of course, is that there's the overtly fun stuff which we can help with as well, which is you know, spaceships and flying around in hyperspace and things like that. Again, you might go, that's not real science, but that's the point. We're not actually about being the science police. We're not actually about being people who uh, make everything realistic in the sense of it being real science but believable. So we're getting more about uh, consistency of your crazy scientific scenario as opposed to being the science police and saying it has to be uh, consistent with science of today. Because we're not there to stop imagination. Let me move to the next thing, which is science books. This is something that uh, we, uh, especially people who do science out there in the world, uh, are supposed to do at some point. We're supposed to write our book. And people have been going for years, when are you going to write that book? And I largely didn't feel any sense of urgency. I, I, I just couldn't bring myself to write another one of those science books that people in my field are supposed to write. And there's not, it's not because there's anything wrong with those books. It just didn't feel urgent. And I was sort of distracted by other things like my research and so on and so forth. And then 18 years ago, I had an idea. I realized that there is something missing from the literature that might actually be really great to see out there. And that is the kind of science book that engages the reader by making them feel part of the conversation about science. And somehow, it made me realize that the whole business of how we talk about science and who talks about science is an important thing that actually isn't really shown much in the scientific literature. It's all polished and cleaned up and then given to you by the expert as, here's the latest stuff, here's how you're supposed to think about it. Those are great books, as I said, but there's room for other ways of doing things. But another 10 years went by when I thought, yeah, conversations, that would be interesting. And then I would take the idea out from time to time tinker with it and put it back. And then I realized something. Every time I took it away, uh, uh, took it out and tinkered with it, put it back, I realized that the visual component had begun to grow. And it was growing and actually beginning to eat up the rest of the book. And it was driven by the following things. Well, when you, when you have a conversation about science and concepts, you, you, you tend to try and scribble sometimes, communicating to whoever you talk to, maybe a diagram, maybe even an equation, if that's your thing. And at some point, you, well, I would like to see those in a conversation. So I thought that would be a nice thing to have in the book. And then I thought, well, wouldn't it be nice to actually see the people? Who's actually having this conversation? We're actually social creatures. Wouldn't it be more engaging to see who's taking part in these kinds of conversations? So yes, let's show some people. Let's, let's seat them somewhere. And then the next question is, well, how about actually seeing where these conversations are taking place? That's another thing that could be engaging. It's familiar. It isn't just science labs and uh, the specialized environments that we see scientists uh, uh, involved in in the media. It's basically everywhere, so why not show that? So show conversations happening out there in the real world where the people are, because that's where the science is actually happening. And then I realized what I was doing was not writing a standard book in my field with lots of prose and ideas and occasional illustrations. No, it had transformed into a fully illustrated, if you like, a graphic novel style nonfiction book about physics. And I realized there's no such thing. No one's ever done that. And then, as you know, when you get engaged by an idea, you, the only way to get free of the idea is just to go out and make the thing and put it out there. So, uh, so another eight years went by, thousands of drawings, and there it is. That's, um, that's the product. So, so I hope you find it interesting. I, I think it's a genuinely new kind of science book. I think there are many more things that can be done. I think there are many more kinds of science that can be uh, talked about in this way that I think may be a new way of uh, uh, adding to the, the wonderful literature that's already out there. Let me tell you one last thing. I realized something very important along the way. Yes, I can show you now what people are doing 
as they're talking about science. I can even show you equations, which you're not supposed to do, apparently, in, the, in these kinds of books, but I do that. I can show you some of the technical diagrams. I can explain how they work. I can show you the people engaging with the ideas and doing things in a way that you normally can't do. But then I realize something else. Comics are actually physics. Graphic novels are actually physics. What do I mean by that? Well, you take a sequence of images and you lay them next to each other and there's a convention for how you read those images. And what you do is, as a reader is you are engaged in creating both space and time when you read a comic. It's a very active kind of way of doing things. Very different from movies, although people think they're the same, they're not. And yes, you're creating space and time. Oh, that's what physics is. So what better medium to actually employ to talk about physics than a medium that actually has the reader already creating some of physics in their minds? That allows me then to do various things. I can talk about some of the latest ideas in space and time, how space and time itself actually is breaking down in the interior of black holes, perhaps. Uh, at, the, at the Big Bang, uh, when the universe was created, space and time came into being from being something that wasn't space and time in some way. It breaks down in ways that I can actually show in the book in various symbolic ways by having the panels break down, by having the whole structure of the reading narrative break down. When two people are talking about the interior of a black hole, they can actually, you can actually have the narrative break down as they're reading the convention for how you read the page actually breaks down as you're reading uh, the book, symbolizing the breakdown of space and time inside the black hole. There are lots of things to play with. I just touch on it a little bit in the book, but maybe I'll end up having to do a volume two because I think there's so many things that can still be done talking about contemporary physics ideas in this way. Okay, I'll end here. Thank you for listening, and uh, I'd be happy to answer the questions.